On October 23rd, 1977, I was walking across this footbridge over the Charles River connecting Boston with Cambridge when this idea struck me of fusing art and science. Then the question was, what would that look like? So I had the idea of building a robot that paints. I love technology, I love science, and I love building things with my hands. And the idea to combine that with art and paintings really excited me. Then a few years later, in 1980 to 81, I actually built my first robot by automating a drafting table. And I converted a garage into a workshop area and bought a small mill to help me make the parts. I worked for Hewlett Packard at the time, and I could check out and take home one of their computers on the weekend, which back then <laughs> retailed for $50,000. That original robot is in the studio today, and their original first painting is hanging on the wall here. But I realized that that robot wasn't going to get me where I needed to go with it. I also had to have a job and a career and an income to get by on. In January of 1994, a Danish friend invited me to go skiing with him in Austria. So I landed in Copenhagen, and Lars said, before we drive down to Austria, let's take the ferry over to Malmo, Sweden. We'll look at this Leonardo da Vinci show that's traveling around. I saw all these wooden mock-ups of his uh, mechanical inventions, and I knew he had painted two of the most famous paintings in the world, the Mona Lisa and the Last Supper. So here's my icon for the person that fused art and science. And I knew right then that I wanted to go back to my original dream and build the robot that paints. That got me really excited when I left that museum. I even hand carried this poster all the way home. A few months later, I took possession of this art studio. And now I'm really faced with this stark question. If I'm going to build a robot that paints, how do you do that? How do you build a robot? What's it look like and what's it supposed to do? I'll never forget that day. I was so excited, but I was so nervous at the same time. I had no idea how to build a robot or even about art or what I was getting into. But it was the day my journey started. The robots back then in the world, even today, don't have all the capabilities that I wanted in a robot to paint. So I had to make my own robot, but I would use their computer, their controller, their box to run my robot work cell. How do you learn about a robot? But that was the real issue back then. Motors, gears, optical encoder, the control cabinet, all the electronics, pneumatics, Programming, that's not as simple as it sounds because you have to have things happen in what the robot world calls real time, which is instantaneous and concurrent, which means multiple programs running simultaneously, talking to each other. I chose Adept Technology, America's largest robot company, which made state-of-the-art robots. And then I flew to San Jose to take their two-week factory automation class for factory engineers. I was a little bit nervous. You had all these serious engineers, and then here's this guy who wanted to build a robot that paints. So after I got back from San Jose, it took me about six years to get to the first painting. When talking about the robot, maybe the most obvious starting place is this giant wall. I knew it had to be large to make large paintings, but I also knew it had to be really heavy and solid so that as the robot moved left and right, up and down, there was no vibration and settling time. And you certainly didn't want it vibrating when you're making a brush stroke on the canvas. So to build this wall, I made a two by four mock-up of this frame just to get an intuitive feeling. And then I started doing hand drawings of the robot in this giant frame and then I made computer aided design drawings, CAD drawings, blueprints. Then I had three companies bid on my CAD drawings and they built this wall, probably weighs 2,000 pounds when you add all the parts together.
To function properly, the robot needs to know where it is in space. And so the XYZ motors, all six motors of this robot provide that. But it has to know where the surface of the wall is at the same time for the tip of the brush. So that's why this wall has to be ground perfectly flat, uniform all the way across its surface. So we always know when that moment of contact will be. To the left of the robot, you have this giant cabinet that's filled with electronics. Inside here, we have the robot's computer, Robotic World calls the controller, and then we have all the shells of electronics that run the motors and the controls for the motors, and then also a lot of other sensing. So down here on the lower right is this giant X motor. It's connected to a drive shaft there's a timing belt on the bottom and on the top. When this motor turns, this whole thing moves left and right. So that's the x-axis. And then up here is the y-axis with its gearbox and optical encoder. And that lifts all this up and down. Then the third motor is the z. And that's this guy here with a right angle gearbox. And that moves all this stuff in and out. That's your z-axis. Now with that, I can make the brush and the tip of the brush go anywhere I want in front of the canvas. However, you also have the angle at which the brush is working, and that's these next three motors in the robot. They're called roll one, pitch, and roll two. Early on, I designed and I built this wrist, and it had the X, Y, Z, which is called the roll one, pitch, and roll two. The design worked but it didn't have the level of sophistication of exquisite brushwork that I needed. So I had to up my electromechanical skills and rather than buying components that cost hundreds of dollars, I ended up buying components that cost a few thousand dollars each. And then I built a second wrist. It has the performance, the smoothness, the accuracy, the resolution that I needed to make the brush hooks that I envisioned. If I orchestrate all six of those motors, I can make a brush choke any way that I want. I can have curves in the middle of the brush choke, and I can have different angles of approach of the brush and the bristles, and I can twist the brush as it goes. I can have more pressure in the middle of the stroke and then hardly any at the end of the stroke, or just maybe a skiff of a brush choke. Here's a mind game for you. There's actually a second robot. The computer knows that this XYZ roll pitch roll is configured as one robot, but I want to be able to dip the wrist into the paint and into the brush washer. So I need a seventh motor to do that. And that's actually a second robot. And it's a second program that runs this second robot. And it goes up and down. And that allows me to go into the paint or into the brush washer. And so the two work independently, but they talk to each other in software. You have this empty generic box that knows nothing about your work cell, and you have to configure that system. And they have these working documents that you fill out. There's like six, eight, 10 pages per motor, and I have seven motors. So there's like 50 pages of detailed numbers that you have to specify that goes into the generic controller. And now that system, that controller, knows what my robot looks like. And then on top of that, you have their custom programming language called V+, which is where I write all the code that implements all my brush strokes and paints my paintings for me. Configuring this operating system was a steep learning curve for me. There's so much behind the scenes that goes on in the operating system to control all these motors to the precision that I want. This is called a manual control pendant, and this comes with most industrial robots when you're going to teach it locations, etc. If I want to make a signature on a painting, I'll put a signature brush in the wrist, and then I'll use the control to move the X over here, and then the Y, and I'll position right where I want the signature to go. And then a lot of times I'll use acetate and paint on it first. And then when I'm going to paint the signature for real, I know exactly where that signature is going to show up. You have to know the exact fraction of a millimeter length of each brush. This touch plate is really a big deal because as I make a new brush, 
it calibrates the length of that brush so I know exactly how it is to about a fourth or a fifth of a millimeter. I use a similar circuit to detect the level of the paint because as you paint, that level in the jar is going to go down and I want to be able to control precisely how much paint is on the tip of the brush. Like anything else that you set out on, it seems, you're going to run into problems. Some are small and some are big and some are massive. And I've encountered all of those during my journey here. Maybe the best example of this was right after I built the robot, but before she had painted anything. I'd give the robot a command to move from here to there. It would move across and it would crash halfway across. And then the computer screen would say, x-axis out of range and I look and it's sitting right in the middle of its range so how can it be out of range this went on many times and it's so demoralizing because I didn't know why it was doing it. I'd do it over and over again and I have similar problems but it crashed in different places I didn't know what to do next this system is industrial strength the x-axis motor it's a DC servo motor but is it's the most that 240 can handle and so poor Sheldon next door, he'd be watching his TV, and he didn't have cable back then, he just had rabbit ears. <laughs> I'd wipe out his TV reception, just be pure static for him. And so that was also a gimme that I've got electromagnetic interference problems that I have to solve. It's 50 feet from the wrist all the way up through the cable carriers, down around and back down into the back of the cabinet. Those wires act like giant antennas, you have power and then next to it you have data and so when you're sending electricity surging through the power cables to the motor to make them turn that surge creates electromagnetic interference and it jumps across to the data cables causing havoc i then had to spend almost two years trying to solve that problem i went through this giant list I made isolation transformers on each shelf in the cabinet. I have integrated circuits that helps boost the signal and helps eliminate noise from those individual data signals. I also separated power from data. Power's on one side and data's on the other side. I made my custom cables here. I even had a radio tower crew come and drill a 13-foot hole with a grounding rod out here. Eventually, all the things I did solved the problem but it was not a happy time. Once I had the basic robot working, it still has to continue to evolve. I still need other features, but I didn't know that until after I did the first two paintings. The first two paintings that I did, I manually would change the jar of paint and I'd manually wash the brush between colors when it needed it. And then I said, man, I can't keep doing this going into the future. I need to automate. In order to automate, you need three things. You need to be able to wash the brush between colors as needed. You need to be able to swap colors when needed. And you need to be able to seal the paint so that the paints don't dry out. With those three things, then you have full automation. And you can go home at night while the robot's still working and come back in the morning and see what it did. Those things are needed to make it fully automated. And then later on, I migrated to larger and larger canvases. And then I could do it in quadrants. I could shift it up and then left and right and down, left and right. But then for Linda's painting, Meditation Upon Death, I ran out of vertical room of which I could slide the canvas up and down. So I built this roller system that sits at the top. It's like a tapestry where there's a roller at the top and then at the bottom. And then you can move the canvas up and down and reposition it. I wanted to do a big, long, horizontal painting. And I said, well, you can't have a roller system on the sides at the same time as on the top. And I just switched the X and Y axis, and I painted it sideways. I just finished a painting that's called Early Light. There is pure joy in the evolution to make this painting. It has new artistic concepts, a new design capability, a lot of new coating to make elaborate brushwork for this painting. Also, I have color on top of color and paint color underneath. So I have layers of colors of paint. I'm also doing this very light brush soak where the bristles are only dipping into the paint half the thickness of a toothpick. Once it's working and you see all this, it's just a pure joy. 
you're on your chosen path. That's exciting. For me, it's excitement, it's joy, and there's always unending fulfillment along this journey.